Dear Heavenly Father, we find ourselves in the same place once again, and that is the place of need, the need of your voice, the need of your ministry to each one of us. Lord God, we thank you for this book of Ruth that we've been making our way through. We pray, Lord, that tonight you would minister to us again, speak to each one, show us ourselves in this passage, show us Christ. Lord God, we uh, are before you with open hearts. We ask, Father God, that you would fill those hearts with good things, that we would feel the power of your hand upon us, both congregation and preacher. May we be one together in the same Holy Spirit. In Jesus we pray. Amen. So the book of Ruth continues in chapter 2 and verses 18 through to 20 tonight, God willing. The title for our message tonight, if that is required for you, is The Right to Redeem. The Right to Redeem. Last time we were thinking for a while about the uh, intentional act of Boaz in making sure that Ruth could glean in the choicest portion of his field and also that he intentionally made sure that there would be grace on purpose uh, dropped so that Ruth could pick it up as she went along. And we compared this with the love of God towards us, the care of God, how he deals with us as he allows us into the richest blessings and how he has set blessing in place for us so that as we persevere in our Christian lives that we too can encounter those blessings at just the right time. Now I know that there are examples of that in the church tonight. I know that there are those even recently who have been walking on the path that Christ has set for them and the blessing has been received into their lives, a blessing that had always been there, but it's just that they got to that place even recently where the blessing was received. And it's a wonderful joy to me to see the truth of God's word being fulfilled in the lives of God's people. It really is marvelous. And so this is what we've seen over the last wee while, particularly last week. Tonight we're going to be looking at, again at the, this man Boaz and Ruth. And we're going to notice that Boaz is an even more powerful picture of Jesus Christ. Um, there's a, an even more beautiful showing of Jesus tonight. So as I said, our title is The Right to Redeem. The first thing we notice in the passage that we've got, we've got before us tonight is that Ruth brings home the barley that she had gleaned, verse 18. She, had, she brought home what she had gathered into the city and to Naomi, her mother-in-law. It must have been a fair amount of barley that she brought back to, to uh, Naomi because Naomi, one, noticed it, but she made some wonderful comment or asked a question that really does express that what Ruth was carrying home was a significant amount. She says to her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? You see, Naomi was surprised clearly at what uh, Ruth was bringing. She was surprised at the abundance of grain that Ruth had with her. 
We could ask the question, or we could put it in slightly different terms, meaning the same thing. Where on earth, where on earth did you glean today? Because this wasn't normal, what Ruth was bringing back to Naomi. This was beyond the norm. If she was simply gleaning around the edges after the, the reapers, gleaning the leftovers, she wouldn't have returned with such a blessing as she had. Now, we know what happened. Naomi doesn't. We know that Boaz blessed her intentionally, gave her this great return. Naomi didn't know that. But not only did Ruth bring back to Naomi the, the barley that she had gleaned from the field, she also brought back what was left over from the meal that she had at Boaz's table. In verse 14, remember, Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached in the parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed. And we notice that when it says, and left, what it, what it means is that she had meal left over. She was satisfied by what Boaz had given her, yet there was some left over. And she brings what was left over back to Naomi, along with the barley that she's been gleaning in the field. Naomi then blesses this man, whoever he might be, she said, Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee, in verse 19. Blessed be he. Someone has taken knowledge of Ruth. Someone has noticed her in a very special way. Filled her with blessing. And here she is bringing it back to Naomi. Naomi, you see, recognized that this was so out of the ordinary, what Ruth was bringing back. So out of the ordinary that there must have been something extraordinary taking place. Someone has clearly engaged with Ruth. Ruth has engaged with someone. There has been an interaction, a personal interaction, for such kindness to have been shown to her daughter-in-law. Absolutely. Boaz noticed her, remember? Boaz fed her. He gave her what she required, and as it turns out, more than she required. And when we glean in the field of our great Boaz, who is Jesus Christ, when we receive grace from his hand, when we gather up the blessings that have been dropped on purpose for us, we always end up with more than we deserve, more than we even require, more than we asked for. This is what Christ does for us. When we glean in his field, we get more than we deserve. We deserve nothing. Oh, by the grace of God, we may, we, we, may, we may gather what's around the edges, but you see, when we are invited into the center and we 
receive what has been dropped for us. It isn't leftovers that we, ha we come home with. We come home with an abundant blessing. We come home with more than we could ever ask. In Malachi 3.10, God challenges. He says, test me in this. He says, I'll open, the, I'll open the storehouses of heaven. I'll open the windows of heaven and the blessing that's coming. You won't be able to contain it. For, folks, we, we're going to quote that verse regularly in my ministry because it's such a truth. When God opens the windows of heaven to bless his people, he blesses his people so much that we can't contain it in the storehouses that we have. Our hearts can't contain what God gives us. Our lives can't contain what God gives us. We always end up with more than we deserve, more than we've even asked. When we glean in the fields that Christ has placed us in, the field of, of Jesus Christ, what we do is we end up realizing the truth of Ephesians 3.20. That he can do far more than all we could ever ask or imagine by his power at work in us. It's a marvelous truth that our God is not a stingy giver. It is such a wonderful thing for us tonight that Almighty God gives and gives and gives. And he makes sure that he is no man's debtor. And so no matter how, we, how hard we work in his field, the blessing is more than we deserve. He always gives us more. Aren't you glad about that? Aren't you glad tonight, Zion, that God gives you more? What do you need? What do you want? What is it in your heart tonight? I don't mean simply material things. What is it you want to be doing for God? How, what is it you want to be giving to God? doesn't matter how much you give to Almighty God. He gives you more back. It doesn't matter that you give and you give and you give. He gives again. He returns to you the blessing. You know, even when we come to a, a time of worship, when we have worked hard to prepare the worship to give to God, no matter how hard you work to prepare a message to give to God, no matter how hard we prepare our hearts before we come to give to God, when we worship, what happens? God gives to us. When we release what we've prepared, God just turns it all back and he pours it out. You know that, don't you? You know that when you worship God, you're pleased. All you want to do, you, you only want to please him. You want to glorify him. You want to make his heart full. And you end up going home a full heart, an overflowing heart. You prepare a message to preach. And you want to do the best you can because you want to glorify God. And you go home with this special sense What's the word? It's not satisfaction, because that, imp that implies a pride. But you go home feeling that the burden has been exercised. You go home feeling empty, but full. It's marvelous, isn't it? Every preacher in here knows that. Every preacher in the world knows that. Every worship leader in the world knows that. You know something? It's not an easy thing to prepare worship, to lead people of God into that place of worship. But it's a marvelous privilege to go home knowing that that's happened and God has been so pleased that he's bestowed it all on you. We come to church with that attitude. 
So we want to serve God. We want to work for God. We want to give God absolutely everything. Like Ruth did in Boaz's field. But she comes home with so much. And we're going to come later on to a portion of Scripture where she comes home with so much. But here she is. She's coming home with this blessing. So, so blessed is she that her mother-in-law can see. Before Ruth mentions anything about anything, Naomi sees that she's been blessed. My goodness, don't you want that? Don't you want people to just look at us and, and before we say a word, they know that God is blessed then. They're a blessed people. I don't know what it is about them, but I can see when I see them. I can see that they've been blessed. That's one of the things that brought me to the Lord. For years, Christians had something that I didn't have. I just knew they had something. Now I know they've been blessed. Christ was living in them. Christ was taking care of their lives through difficulties and through joys. Oh, that when people look at Zion, they would say, that's a blessed church. They've been blessed by God to such a degree that, that I, can, I can see it in them. Oh, may that be the case for us. May they realize when they look upon you and me that whatever we think God can do, God can do much more. Not only does, is it true to say God can do much more, it's beautiful to realize that God does much more. So you're sitting there tonight and your situation is you're working hard for God. You're witnessing every time you get an opportunity. There's an area in serving God where you're serving God's people. You're, you're, you're doing all that you can and you're sitting there tonight and you're thinking, I'm struggling. <laughs> I'm struggling to do this. The answer is keep doing it. Keep serving God. Keep serving God's people. Because you see, you're going to return home with such a blessing that other people are going to notice it and are going to be drawn to the God that you have been drawn to. When we realize that God blesses us beyond our wildest expectations, that lifts our lives to a different level. We were thinking this morning about trusting and not being afraid, but when we realize that that God wants to bless to such an abundant degree his faithful people. Doesn't it help us to be faithful to God? Someone might be sitting there thinking, well, we don't serve God in order to get. We just serve God because we want to serve God. So here's the challenge. Try serving God and not be blessed by doing so. You try to serve God and not be blessed. It's absolutely impossible. When you glean in the field that belongs to Christ, like Naomi, like uh, Ruth did for Boaz, when you glean in that field, you cannot serve him and not receive. 
doesn't work that way. God will be no man's debtor. Who do we think we are that we can give to God and God says, oh, thank you very much. We give to God with a spoon. You've heard it said, and he gives back with a spade load. Oh, well, I'm going to take a spade and I'm going to give to God with a spade, a spade load of service, blessing and honor. And God gives back with a bulldozer. That's how it works. Don't you think, don't, don't let us think that we can outgive Boaz, our great Boaz. We cannot outgive our great Boaz. What we need, he will provide, and there will be that left over. Praise the Lord. So we're an abundantly blessed people. Where have you gleaned today? That's why we shouldn't spend our time working elsewhere. Give your all to the Savior. That's how churches survive, of course. Churches survive when God's people give what they can, all that they can to him. He blesses abundantly by keeping the church. And I don't mean to continue to go on about Zion, but where else is there? This is where we are. It's God who is faithful. It's God who does it. But isn't it marvelous that when the people of God in this place have continually given themselves to him, have continually gleaned in Christ's field, that what has happened is that he is so blessed that he kept the church and is keeping the church. What we try to give to Jesus, we're here receiving what he's pouring out upon us. Our aprons are full. Not that we've earned anything. Not that we've earned it. But that he, by his grace, has said, you think you've given to me? Watch this. I'm keeping the church. I'm going to sustain the church. I'm going to bless the people in the church. I'm going to bless you in your life. Do you think you've given to me? Watch what I'm giving to you. What do you think about that? We'll never outgive God. Hallelujah. So let's give all that we can. One brother said to me one time, and this is about giving to the Lord, reaping, uh, uh, gleaning in his field. And his brother said to me, when times have been difficult, I've thought, I really can't do that for the Lord this month. What if I might need whether it be money or time or whatever. Whether, what, what if I might need it this month? He says, those are the months where I've struggled. But when I've said I'm just given, I'm just giving my life to Christ. I'm just giving my effort, my time, my energies to Jesus. That's when the month has just sailed through. That's what he said to me. And that is the truth. Now, I'm not talking about money. I couldn't care less. What I'm talking about is you in your life seeking to give to God. Don't hold back. We don't hold back. We give what we have. We give who we are and watch what he will do. Zion, let's give ourselves completely to Christ. Let's continue to give ourselves completely to Christ is what I should be saying. Let's continue as a church to give ourselves over to what Jesus Christ is about, our Father's business, and to do it, get the sleeves rolled up spiritually and get on about it. Because I'll tell you something, when we glean in our father's field in the field of christ our great boaz 
the blessing is going to be abundant because he's got to outdo us. God must outdo us. I wonder if you're pleased at that. I wonder if you're pleased that our God is such a wonderfully blessing God, an abundantly blessing God. Where have you been re uh, gleaning? In whose field? Let's not waste our efforts anywhere other than in the field that belongs to Jesus. And so Ruth answers Naomi when Naomi says to her, or asks her, where have you been working? Whose field have you been in? And, and Ruth answers the question. She identifies this man. She says, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz, at the very end of verse 19. The man's name is Boaz. Of course, Naomi knew Boaz, or at least she knew of him. She was aware of this man. He was a relative of her late husband, Elimelech. He was a relative of the family. In verse 1, we're told that. In verse 3, we're told the same that he was of the family of Naomi's husband. And I wonder if you can sense the excitement beginning to rise in this woman, Naomi. Can you sense the excitement? Listen to what she says in verse 20, the beginning of verse 20. Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living, and to the dead. Blessed be he of the Lord. A, a specific blessing that she's giving to Boaz, this man who has taken notice of Ruth and through Ruth has provided for Naomi. And then she says, not only blessed be he, but blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Who is she speaking about? When she says, who has not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. She may be speaking of Boaz, but she's more likely speaking of Yahweh, blessing through Boaz. She's more likely speaking about Yahweh's covenantal blessing through Boaz. You see, let's read it together. Put it together. Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and the dead. It's the Lord who hasn't left off his kindness. And he's showing his kindness through Boaz. He's using Boaz to bless Ruth and to bless Naomi. Oh, why are you laboring this point? Because Naomi is of the covenant people. And 10 years or so before it, she with Elimelech walked away to search for food elsewhere. They were hungry. And so they went looking for food. But they were part of the covenant people. Hallelujah. God kept them all the time that they were in Moab. Brought them back to Bethlehem. And is blessing them. Why? Because he keeps his covenant. He never turns his back on his covenant. And here he is, Naomi, I'm going to keep feeding you, Naomi. I'm going to keep providing for you through Ruth. I'm going to keep providing for her through Boaz. 
Boaz is my representative, as we'll see in just a minute. But here he is, blessing, because they are part of the covenant. You remember how Naomi said at the end of the first chapter, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Verse 21, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? Wow. Here is Naomi, who had become bitter, because she perceived that God had rejected her. Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because I feel bitter in my soul. God has hurt me. But now she's beginning to see through Boaz's he said, grace, she's beginning to see the grace of a covenant keeping God. He's saying, yeah, Naomi, you went away, but you're back and I'm feeding you. I kept you while you were away. I've brought you back and I'm going to continue to feed you. That is God. We see God working through Boaz just as he works through Christ in our lives. How blessed are we covenant-keeping God. She's suddenly realizing that if you're part of the covenant people of God, you will never be rejected by God. Even when you've thought it's been difficult and whatever, God has been keeping you, and now you're back in the place of blessing. Each one of us knows that in our lives. I'm not even talking about Zion. I'm talking about us as individuals. We know that there have been times when, when we felt, oh, be honest. Be honest about it. Don't sit there and, and say, oh, I've never felt that. There have been times in our lives where we felt that God has turned his back. But even at those times, brothers and sisters, we can now say, he sustained me. He kept me. And now he is blessing me all over again. Because I am a part of his covenant family. That's the truth of it. You see, here is Naomi realizing that God hasn't rejected her, never rejected her. He's brought her home, and, and here, is she, here is Naomi suddenly beginning again to realize the true meaning of her name, Naomi. She's not bitter. She's beginning to taste the sweetness of the grace of Almighty God all over again. Do you need to taste that? Are you tasting that tonight? Are you beginning to taste the sweetness of God's grace? Oh, it's been hard. It's been difficult. And maybe, maybe you're just getting a, a flavor. But that's a joy. Because if you're beginning to get a wee flavor of the grace of God again, and how, how sugary, sweet, and beautiful it is, then you need to be aware of this. That's only a flavor. It's only a taste. And the blessing is going to overwhelm you and you're going to be back in the fullness of the grace of God. If God is giving you a flavor of his, his grace once again, he's going to give you the full, the full lot. He's going to give you the full flavor. It's not going to be on the tip of your tongue. It's going to satisfy you. It's been hard. It's been bitter. It's been barren. It's been dry. Oh, my goodness, I've been walking in all sorts of directions, but suddenly I'm beginning to taste it. Why? Because God is bringing you back. 
God has brought you back or God is bringing you back. Hallelujah. Who can say hallelujah with me tonight that there's a taste of grace in this place? Do you taste the grace of God in Zion Baptist Church? Do you taste the grace of God in your life? Oh, hallelujah. Naomi, you weren't rejected. You were sustained and have brought you back. When God reminds us of his faithfulness, of his kindness, of his goodness, of his love, of his mercy, it just closes our mouths. What can we say? That's why he gives us the gift of tongues, of course. Because when we've got nothing to say, the Holy Spirit can just tell him for us. That's a different message. All through the New Testament, we're shown that this beautiful grace of God is ours. And when we grasp it, Bitterness is replaced by the sweetness of his grace. But now Naomi gives Ruth some really significant information about Boaz. Verse 20. Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. Other translations are more accurate than the authorized version at this point. And you know as well as I that other translations render the word, the Hebrew word, which is goel. They render that word as a kinsman or guardian redeemer or a redeemer. The Hebrew word means uh, the nearest male relative who has the right to redeem. He has the right to redeem. You notice that? What she's saying to Ruth about Boaz? Boaz has the right to redeem us. Boaz has the right to deliver us. Boaz has the right because he is a kinsman redeemer. Boaz has the right. It doesn't mean that Boaz has the obligation, because he certainly didn't. There is no obligation to redeem, but there must be a willingness to redeem. Boaz was not forced, he wanted to. Boaz was not coerced, he was willing to redeem. The kinsman redeemer must be willing to perform redemption. You know where this is, don't you? You know what I'm talking about. Oh, hallelujah. Look at verse... 11 of chapter 3. This is Boaz to Ruth. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. Hallelujah. There he is. There's Boaz, the willing redeemer. I'm willing to do what needs to be done. But did you know that all through the Old Testament, in ancient Israel, the concept of a kinsman redeemer was intended as an expression of Yahweh in his redemption of the Israelites out of Egypt. 
The whole concept of the kinsman redeemer was to reflect the redemption that the Israelites knew from Yahweh. Wow. Here is Boaz, and he's reflecting God. He is the redeemer of Ruth and Naomi as a reflection of the redemption of Israel from Egypt. In Leviticus chapter 25, we've got this presentation of the kinsman redeemer and so many different aspects of that role or that function. And every single one of them is an echo of God. Leviticus 25, and without going through all the different examples, we'll read verse 55 where it is summed up. Leviticus 25, 55. The reason that there are kinsmen redeemers, that there are people within the, the near family who have the right to redeem. For unto me the children of Israel are servants. They are my servants, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. The reason for these roles within the people of Israel was to reflect the Lord God Almighty who brought them out of the land of slavery. Here is Boaz reflecting this Redeemer. How good is that? Even in the ordinary living of life in ancient Israel, there were reminders everywhere of the redemption that God had brought about for his people. Even in your family and in my family in ancient Israel, we're all in ancient Israel now for a minute, you have in your family someone close enough to you who has the right to redeem you when things become difficult. I've got that in my family. Every Israelite family had this man reminding them of the beauty and the wonder and the greatness of God and the redemption of the nation. Not only with the right with a willing heart. In Psalm 78, verse 35, and they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 14. I wonder what it's going to say. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy redeemer the Holy One of Israel. In the same book, but chapter 43, verse 14 again, Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. This is the one that Boaz is reflecting. Did you know that in Isaiah, every time the word goel is used, 
it is always speaking about God. It's never used to speak about anyone else. It's only used to speak about God. And then here is Boaz in Ruth being presented as this kinsman redeemer, the reflection of the grace and compassion of the Lord. But you see, in reflecting God like this, he's not just reflecting God in the general sense. He's reflecting God in the particular sense. He's reflecting Jesus Christ. We look at this little passage, we look at this book, and we see ourselves in Ruth and Naomi, and we see Christ in Boaz. When we look at these verses that we've got before us tonight, oh, how clearly we see ourselves and how clearly we see God, how clearly we see Jesus. Jesus Christ is the ultimate kinsman redeemer. He's our redeemer. Oh, hallelujah. But he's our kinsman redeemer. He's our willing redeemer. He has the right to redeem. Did you know that Jesus Christ has the right to redeem us? But did you know that Jesus Christ is willing to redeem us. Of course we do. That's why we praise him so much. That's why we adore him. We were around the Lord's Supper earlier on because we realize that nothing forced him to go to Calvary to redeem us. He went to Calvary in order to redeem us because it was in his heart to do so. He wanted to do so. He is our willing redeemer. Oh, hallelujah, we praise his holy name that he is our willing redeemer, but he's more than just a redeemer who comes with no real interest other than to be good to us and to be kind to us. No, oh, no, he's our kinsman. You look at Hebrews chapter 2, and surely this thrills us when we read verses like this. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We are one. The one who sanctifies and us who are being sanctified, we are his brothers. He is our brother. He is of our family. He is the one in our family, the only one in our family who has the right to redeem. And he has the power to redeem. And he has the heart to redeem. He comes to you, brothers and sisters, his brothers, and he dies for you, his brothers, in order to lead you, his brothers, into freedom, out of the clutches of the enemy. How marvelous is our Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, we are redeemed through his blood, through faith in his blood. He shed his own blood for our sins, all for you and for me, because he is our kinsman redeemer. You and I, today are accepted in the beloved, our kinsman redeemer. You and I know redemption, the forgiveness of sins because of the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 1, 6 and 7 and throughout the New Testament. Redeemed by the blood of my brother. He gave himself for he had the right to do so. And he wanted to do so. How do you feel tonight when you realize that, that Jesus, our greater Boaz, looked upon us 
and wanted to die for us. How precious a redeemer is our Lord Jesus Christ to redeem us from slavery to sin, set free. Romans 6 talks about us being set free from the slavery to sin. We're set free through the blood of Jesus from all that we lost at the fall. When we were cast out of the garden, separated from God, our kinsman redeemer has come and our kinsman redeemer has set us free from estrangement and he's brought us back to almighty God. So when we look at this passage, we see Ruth and we see Naomi and we see Boaz. But what we really see is us and Jesus Christ. He has left handfuls of purpose that we would pick it up. He has abundantly blessed us so that others will look upon us and see it. And he is our Redeemer, our glorious, wonderful, holy brother. How precious is he? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for our kinsman Redeemer, who didn't only have the right to redeem but he was willing to do so. Here am I, send me. Father, we are so grateful tonight for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the grace that is ours in our Savior. May we never become complacent about it, but may we always be praising his holy name. Blessed be the one who has taken notice of us, who has not stopped loving his covenant people. How we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.